name's Michael Reese, I go by Mick. I, uh, I graduated from Rinse High School and my cousin's fiance at the time had just got out of the Navy and he kind of convinced me that, hey, go do this and try this job and it was gonna be a yeoman, which is administration. I thought that'd be great. Um, so myself and seven others decided to do the buddy program and uh, ended up joining and realizing that's not what I was gonna be and became a corpsman instead. We got split after boot camp, but we were supposed to stay together the whole time. But I ended up being contracted for the seaman side and he was contracted for the airman side, so he had to go to the aviation courses. Um, uh, two others were together, um, and one ended up uh, getting medically discharged, and the other one only did four years. But the other two that joined at the same time, uh, they both went through school, boot camp school, and got split at their first duty stations. But of, of all of us, the three of us were the only ones that stayed in more than 20. I was at 30, uh, Marty was at 22, and Don was at 24 years. My father was in the Army. He was with the 82nd Airborne for four years. Uh, my stepfather, who he had gone to the Army buddy system, was in the same unit with him. Um, my grandfather on my dad's side was uh, Navy World War II. So that's kind of like, you know, the, the heritage type. And we can relate. Not, not, didn't talk a lot when I was growing up, but when I was, became a Navy sailor like himself, we could always talk that. And I, I actually nicknamed him Gunner because he was a gunner's mate. So I never called him grandpa, I called him gunner. Um, stepfather, my sec uh, other se stepfather was a Marine Corps helicopter mechanic. So there was some background, but I had, you know, and, and my mom tells me I was destined because I always played army, played soldiers, that kind of stuff. And she goes, she wasn't surprised when I decided to join and not surprised I stayed on as long as I did. February 83, I reported to the USS Carl Vinson as an unde undesignated seaman and was uh, assigned to the ship's armory. Um, from there, I was uh, uh, assigned to the uh, Special Weapons Unit on board the carrier and then uh, decided I wanted to stay in and decided to become a corpsman uh, and was shifted over to the medical department, did my uh, on-the-job training which led to my acceptance to the school and went to San Diego in early 85. And then from there, Naval Hospital Camp Pendleton was my first duty station as a corpsman. Re-enlisted there for the, uh, what they call FMF, the Fleet Marine Force, to be a corpsman with them. Uh, and that's when the whole, that's when everything started was then. Um, my first duty was with 1st Marine Division, 2nd uh, Battalion, 9th Marines, Echo Company originally as a senior line company corpsman um, and then moved to the headquarters service company in the, B, in the battalion aid station. Um, after that, transferred to 3rd Battalion 1st Marine, who I deployed with for, uh, in support of Desert Storm. And then uh, came back, uh, got to come home earlier before everybody else after everything was done in, in Iraq and attended uh, Naval Air Crew School, become a search and rescue corpsman out of Naval Air, Marine Corps Air Station in El Toro. After that, uh, I was selected as, I was selected and assigned to be uh, the search and rescue corpsman to, to support SEAL operations at, at uh, Naval Special Warfare Development Group. Uh, there I made chief. I was able to attend a lot of great schools. Another reason why I kept going. Um, after I made chief, I was assigned to Field Medical Service School in Camp Pendleton, California. Uh, that was 90, um, That was the school where they taught corpsmen to serve with the Marines, field combat operations, etc. cetera. Um, made senior chief out of there, went to Naval Hospital Camp Pendleton. And uh, from there again, was, I was on to the 15th mute in support of OIF, where I was a medical planner for the 15th mute, 15th Marine Expeditionary Unit um, on board the SS Tarawa. Uh, and then, augmented from the hospital to support the, the, uh, the, the medical facilities there in, in Fallujah during Phantom Fury. Made Master Chief and my first command was 3rd Marine Aircraft Wing. From there I was assigned to 1st Marine Division as a Command Master Chief and augmented from that to support OIF a third time um, as the uh, Marine Corps Forces Forward 
Command Master Chief with uh, General Kelly uh, at the time. Um, final unit was Marine Corps Forces Command in Norfolk, Virginia, and uh, retired in December of 13. When I was, a, when I was an E-5, I was looking, that's usually, I always call that the, the split in the road, because you're either going to get out or you're going to stay in. Um, and I was thinking about going to putting in for a uh, warrant officer program to be a PA. Thought about doing nurse practitioner, thought about doing um, medical administration, and ended up just re-enlisting and going back to division. Um, and uh, the only reason why I kept going was because each billet was, was, ch was more challenging than next. And, uh, and, and that's what kept me going more than anything next to the people. I've been on smaller ships, uh, the old LSTs, which were um, flat bottom boats and for the amphibious side of, of the Navy. And uh, smaller crews, you know, probably just over 150 uh, sailors on board. But you get to a carrier and the department is 150 sailors, you know, and you bring on the air wing, the squadrons, and it's an additional 2,000, 2,500 sailors as well. So it was a floating city. I mean, you had four different chow halls and you had 24 hours going on and operations and that type of thing. My, my, my birthing was actually right underneath uh, the number three catapult. So when they, they would land, and then when they take off, you just hear all the noises all night long. So you just got used to it. Uh, the amphibs I was on, um, not, not a lot of noise, but because at night you're not really doing operations. But when you're doing, when they do whale deck operations and they're launching the amphibious tractors and stuff like that, that makes, you know, that, that makes a lot more noise, but nothing like a carrier <laughs> by far. <laughs> One thing you can ask any any Marine, any sailor that's been with the Marines, they've done amphibious operations, that the, the one experience is when they, they call it, they call it sticks. So you're in a stick of however many personnel are in it. And you'll hear over the head, over the head, they'll say, stick number 12, report to the whale deck. So you make your way down there with all your gear and they put you in the back of the, uh, of the, um, the Amtrak. And uh, they sit there and they just wait, wait, wait. So you're sitting in this thing, and it's 120 degrees, it's humid. You know, and there's fuel fumes. And you're just sitting there just getting nauseous and that kind of thing. And you t try to doze off and then all of a sudden you feel the lunge that's getting ready to take off. You can feel the tracks on the bottom of the deck, but as soon as it hits the water, it actually dips and you can feel from the water how cool it immediately gets. And then you just sit there and now you just get, because of your equilibrium is off. And so you fall asleep again because you're floating in the water and then all of a sudden you feel the tracks hit the sand and next thing you know you're on the shore the doors open up and you're trying to get out of there. <laughs> OIF-1, we, uh, it was a tail end so it was a lot to help with the, with the populace. So we did um, medical uh, surveillance, bring them in, screening people for whatever we could help them with and of course food distribution that type of thing. Um, second time around, uh, went out and did food, di food disp distribution and uh, also helped with the Iraqi um, voting when they were voting at, uh, for uh, their, their new president. Um, and uh, third time around, uh, infrastructure build, water, wa water, uh, water access, school access, uh, the electrical grid, that type of thing. So yeah, pretty good. Good, feel good to do something, you know, after everything was going on with the conflict, to actually do some good for them. We're coming from all over the country to support this, this, you know, this mission. Um, so when I, that was one of the things that I always said that when we got home, we got the fanfare, everybody was waiting for us, families were there and everything like that, but after that, I can't. I don't even remember really seeing anybody other than ones that were at the hospital with me, which was only a handful. Um, Any time after that, and I, I'm I'm aware that a lot of 
Uh, a lot of our folks, obviously PTSD, were having a lot of issues with that. The challenge was keeping everybody together because uh, of the numerous casualties that we were seeing coming through the doors every day um, and keeping them motivated, keeping them focused. And at the same time, understanding the human factor that comes with everything, every experience. You can't deny that. And that's what we used to do is encourage it. Don't bottle it, don't, don't let it get to you as much as you can. If you let it out, if you gotta go over here and sit in a corner and be by yourself, well, we'll respect that and do that, but just be ready to come back and do your job. You know, and that's one of the hardest things is that, that the human condition is what it really comes down to. So as a senior chief, I knew that was gonna happen. Um, and I had a great leadership to support that. And so I, it, we built that, we built that uh, confidence and respect for each other in a short period of time before we actually deployed. But I think uh, what we did at the beginning really helped in the long run in the fact that we, I'm not saying we were any more unique than, the, the, than our predecessors or anybody after us, but for that group, it, it worked perfect to be able to have the leadership support them and know, know and be aware of the human condition. So yeah, I wouldn't change anything. I got to, got to jump out of aircraft, I got to rappel out of aircraft, I got to go overseas, I got to see men and women at their finest. What else could you ask for? You know, especially after a culmination of 20 plus years of training. When I retired, what I, what I was told was it was a total of two years, nine months, and three days of shipboard time. And that's uncalled for for a sailor. That's why, you know, I, I was in the Navy, but I was on what they call greenside. And then when you're greenside, you're either with the CVs or you're working with the Marines or you're working with special forces. At my retirement, it was in Norfolk. And Norfolk is the, the hub of, Na of the Navy in, on the East Coast. And so my peers were all these command master chiefs working for Navy admirals and they'd done carrier tours and you know, they, you name it, they did it. And I made a point that I told him about my short sea time. And one of them came up to me and he says, I spent 13 years total shipboard and you only got two years and nine months. That's ridiculous. <laughs> and I said, hey, choose your rate, choose your fate, we used to say. It's, it's, it's good being a veteran, it's proud to have done my time and served, but most importantly, again, it still comes back to the experiences and the people that I experienced them with. You know, that's the only thing I really miss is the people.